Hi. Thank you all for being here today. Um, yeah, so networking and regional comprehensive. Uh, comprehensive is a summary of a DH summit. Um, so I went to Salem State University um, in July, um, and the summit was three days. And um, the way I got involved in this is back in December of 2016, in the midst of a crazy semester of me teaching an honors class. Um, I was contacted by uh, Rupika Bissam at uh, Salem State, and she goes by Rupsi. Um, so Rupsi uh, emailed me, and I was very familiar with this, working with teaching faculty here at SIU. She was writing an NEH grant. <laughs> and she's like, I oh, only need you know, letters of people that will participate um, you know, would you be willing? And I was like, sure. And she, you know, she sent me the letter, so all I had to do was like go in and you know change my name or something because it was just a form letter. And I thought I'll never hear from her again, and I was wrong. <laughs> so like probably six months later, she's like, hey, we got funded, so um, I'm gonna need you to come out to um, Salem, Massachusetts, in uh, in summer of 2018. And I was like, okay, and. Uh, yeah, and I really kind of did not know what to expect. Um, I thought maybe this was going to be like, they were going to have people come in and like, it'd be this big presentation and stuff. So didn't know what to expect. And it was actually a small group of us. There were just eight that they brought in and um, two of us from the Midwest and um, the rest from the East Coast. Uh, this is currently um, some web space that Rupsi has. Um, and we're going to be populating this page with um, information that we gathered uh, there and then just going forward. So that's what it looks like. Um, also was sponsored by, uh, I don't know if it's showing on there, it shows up on here, but the Institute of um, Museum and Library Services as well as um, NEH. So a nice, nice big grant uh, project. And um, these are all the different institutions that were represented there. So, Group C uh, being the, one of the directors. Um, she is an assistant professor, professor of English, um, and she's up for tenure this fall, too. So, she started at Salem State the same time I started here at SIUE. And she's also faculty fellow for Digital Library Initiatives, coordinator of the Digital Studies Graduate Certificate Program, and coordinator of the VA in ED English Education Program at Salem State University. And I think that's just actually a sampling of what she, she's basically like the Jessica de Spain, Christine Hildebrandt of Salem State <laughs> um, University. And uh, she had a co-director, Susan Edwards, who um, works in the library at Salem State. And actually the three days that we were there, uh, we were meeting in the library, which is brand new. They actually just built a brand new building for, uh, for the library. It's like state of the art, really beautiful. Um, uh, they also brought in Kirk Ann from SUNY uh, Geneso. Uh, he's an assistant director of systems and networking research technologist. So he's in the Department of Computing and Information Technology. Um, and then Elisa Basharo Bondar from University of Pittsburgh, Greensburg. She's an associate professor of English and also the director of Pitt Greensburg's Center for the Digital Text. Uh, there was me, humanities <laughs> librarian uh, from SIUE. And Lisa Leterio uh, from Bridgewater State University. She's an assistant professor of English there. Um, Pam Mitchum from Appalachian State University. She made sure that we knew to pronounce it Appalachian. And she's the coordinator of digital scholarship and initiatives there. Um, Chuck Ryback from University of Wisconsin Green Bay, uh, who um, is a dean, uh, basically for the arts and humanities there. Uh, Paul Sch uh, Schacht um, from SUNY, and he's a professor of English, and also um, he is uh, serving as a associate provost. <laughs> so many of these participants wearing multiple hats. Um, Yannikin Smucker was from West uh, Chester State University and she's an associate professor of history. Um, 
So, and we also had an honorary participant uh, who I'm so carrying, Mr. Henry Franklin Del Rio. Um, so his first NEH summit um, in utero. So he's uh, well on his way to advocating for the humanities. Um, so each uh, one of these uh, participants gave a talk to share what they're doing in digital humanities, essentially, um, at their institution, too. And um, I'm going to share uh, basically my talk, but I will say that everybody, it seemed like they were all very self-taught. And once it got out on campus that they had these skills and knowledge, then it was like, can you do this for me? Um, and the institutions varied a little bit in size in terms of um, full-time enrollment, um, but you know we had a lot of like these conversations, especially during lunch about um, you know the faculty. I was really surprised like hearing about um, the faculty having a union. So there were all kinds of you know just lively discussions about disputes about that because we're in the midst of that here um, at SIE. They were actually really surprised to hear that we were just now forming that. Um, thought that was interesting. And um, yeah, and uh, one of uh, the, so Elisa Bashara Bandar, um, who's the director of Pitt's, uh, Pitt Greensburg Center for the Digital Text, um, she has a project where um, it's called Digital Mitford. So she does a lot of like text encoding and she needed help with working on the, that project and then needed people with skills, so then she has a coding um, school that she hosts in the summertime. So you can, you can go to that and I think it's pretty affordable. You know, I'd never heard of it. Um, and that's the other thing, like we'd never heard of any, you know, of each other in the projects that, that we're doing at the different institutions. And I think that that's sort of what Rupsi was looking at, like to think like we need to build this network so you can easily access and find out about these projects. You know, we can go and like find out about Walt Whitman. <laughs> um, we hear a lot about that in the, the bigger projects, but these, you know, these smaller institutions are doing really great things. Um, so, my talk was, um, I kind of came at this uh, from collaborating and advocating. So, <clears throat> I am by no means a digital humanities expert, and actually, so I was hired in um, August of 2013, that's when I joined SIU, and was hired to serve as the liaison to the departments of anthropology, English, foreign language, and philosophy, and so just support the students and faculty in those departments with research, with um, updating the library's collection, providing library instruction. Well, also, um, Dr. Jessica Despain was on my search committee, um, and I, uh, I think that, that she really hoped, and I think um, Dr. Hildebrandt as well, hoped that they would find this really great like digital humanities scholar and you know, hire them as a librarian, like there'd be somebody with those skills, and they got me. <laughs> so, the smiley, grow your own DH librarian. So, um, <laughs> so um, and what I learned, especially in my first semester, is that I've actually been a long time digital humanities user. Um, and so wasn't aware of that, um, that I was using all of these materials. Um, so, uh, my, um, and I, I learned a lot about it just in my interview. I was asked to, to give a speech on digital humanities, and I still really loved the prompt that I got. It was, um, what is the role of an academic library in understanding, providing access to, and nurturing the evolution of digital humanities scholarship? And so I continue <laughs> um, to think about that question as I work here, and, um, I, I, I still stand by um, what I said in that interview, that I think that there, it's a threefold um, kind of uh, role. So that library, uh, libraries and librarians should be advocates, that we should be guides, 
we should be collaborators um, for digital humanities. Um, and uh, later in my first semester, um, I heard my favorite, uh, still my favorite uh, definition um, of digital humanities from um, my SIUB colleague and DH scholar, Christine Hildebrandt, who said digital humanities is breathing new life into old things. So, and uh, she says this at um, the VAC camp that we attended in November of 2013 at WashU. And it stuck with me. <laughs> you didn't know you were gonna be featured so much in this talk today. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so um, I was really excited to be um, joining this institution um, and learning about this new discipline to me anyway, um, because people were so passionate about it. And um, working in the library seemed like a really cool way um, for me to be a part of it. <clears throat> so I, um, I shared um, at the summit um, information about the Iris Center. <laughs> and they were fascinated to hear about, about the Iris Center and they, we were all on laptops in this room so they were all like, you know, going to all of our links and everything as everyone talked. And I, um, of course, mentioned um, Dr. Despain, Dr. Hildebrandt, because they're the co-directors, and mentioned their um, their projects. So, which they were really, really excited about. Um, they had a lot of questions about the Iris Center, and one of them being, oh, is it like an actual space? <laughs> because a lot of the other institutions would have like this, it was a conceptual center. So it existed in, you know, a virtual way, I guess, perhaps, or maybe in your your mind. And I explained that, you know, we are still trying, I believe, to get the IBAT uh, center status. So I said, we're, you know, and they understood that too. So in their different state contexts, it's, you know, they're encountering similar, similar things. Um, but yeah, they were um, fascinated by this and excited to hear about the IRIS Center and what we did. And I apologize if I sound out of breath, but this baby is just taking up all of my lung space. Um, <laughs> um, so I um, immediately jumped in to um, participating in the Iris Center. Um, Dr. Despain uh, invited me to boot camp my first semester here. So if you're not familiar with boot camp, so with her wide, wide world, um, project. Um, she has uh, often an IRCA uh, student and uh, possibly other volunteers that uh, participate. So I came in and met students there and um, I shared about the, the IRCA program which you're probably familiar with uh, here and maybe even some IRC we have IRCA, former IRCA students right over here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there were similar programs at the other institutions. So um, this also brought up um, conversations about, and I know that I've talked to uh, Jessica about it and Christine about, you know, can you have students volunteering to be part of these projects and like compensation? And, and we had discussions about that and it's, it seems to be very tricky um, and not unique to us. <laughs> Um, and certainly um, because we're working with undergraduate students and not graduate students that have ass assistantships or, you know, and possibly higher skills or more funding from your institution. Um, one of the things that, like tangible things that came out of um, collaborating uh, with uh, students working on the wide, wide world was uh, this research guide. It's a 19th century uh, book history. <clears throat> And so we have a product in the library called um, LibGuides. It's through a company called SpringShare. And uh, it allows uh, the librarians to give a, um, a login to just one guide. So we were actually able to collaborate with the students, Dr. Spain and I, to 
update this and add information and just very common things that they needed to use um, resources to answer questions related to that project so that was kind of fun and didn't require too much more than me just facilitating <laughs> so the students were great at populating um, the different tabs in that guide um, and also um, Jessica and I collaborated to write about this um, in uh, a book that came out, I think it was just last year, that we, um, that the Association of uh, College and Research Libraries uh, published. So ACRL, that's the um, Academic Library Association. Uh, so we talked about our work in the Irish Center with ERCA students. Informal learning tools in the digital humanities, a case study of faculty librarian collaboration. <clears throat> okay. um, another thing that came out of working in the Iris Center, which was sort of unexpected to me, um, is that I was coaching a lot of SIUV students to go on to library school. <laughs> and, you know, this is these are programs you can apply to and this is how you get funding and this is some tips to get that assistantship to get your tuition waiver um, so it's been exciting to see um, students in their careers and and uh, and where they they end up so some kind of all over the country <clears throat> and okay so. as i was saying earlier i was a DH user, not a practitioner, and so a novice coming here. And what I've done is try to read a lot and then also visit um, different institutions and their kind of spaces um, that were similar to the Iris Center. Um, the Scholarly Commons um, is probably the closest to um, what the Iris Center does, and that's at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Um, they actually have a space, it's a pretty nice size space, and with different uh, workstations, different technologies, um, different softwares available, and then of course support to help use those materials and open to the entire um, campus to come and use that. And that, that, is, that space is actually like in the library building. <clears throat> the Illinois Maker Lab um, is actually just a 3D printing lab. Um, and there are implications for that with um, with, D with digital humanities. Um, it's actually run by the business school, um, and that's where it's located on campus at um, U of I Urbana-Champaign. Um, and it's pretty slick. <laughs> and, and of course, like, they create different things. I might have, yeah, I think I do have the keychain that they gave me when I visited. Yes, so they have these and I think we we're trying to print some of these in the library because we have a 3D printer over there. But of course, orange for University of Illinois, uh, shaped like Illinois, it says Maker Lab. And they sell these um, for a profit. So, and that's the point, I guess, that's why it's in the business school, um, <laughs> that they're like profiting from other, you know, students coming in there to use it. Uh, the Fab Lab um, is pretty cool, very artsy. Um, and very messy, so um, it's qu quite different from going into the Maker Lab and, and visiting that. Again, the Fab Lab is in um, at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, so I kind of hit a bunch of places <laughs> when I visited there. And um, that's actually open to the community. They can come in and use um, different things to make fabrics. Um, I think some people were also like publishing books, like children's books. They showed us one, um, one thing like that a t-shirt press, that kind of thing. And we have a Maker Lab in our library that we're opening, and there are some tools like that um, that you'll see later uh, this fall um, as we get that set up and running. Uh, the University of Kansas, um, so KU, they have the Institute for Digital Research and Humanities. And in 2015, I visited their, um, their website and saw that they were having a, um, a DH forum. And you could just go in and register. There was like, they didn't ask for money. <laughs> just 
just like your name and stuff. And so I, I was a little nervous. So I registered, but then I had to them and I said, I don't go, to, you know, I don't attend school there. I don't work there. Um, is it all right that I'm going to come out? And they're like, yeah, that's fine. And I uh, visited, I think, their site. Yeah, so this is, so I was there in September 2015. And uh, this year, Digital Frontiers is the, the theme uh, for this forum. And I believe they're charging maybe $20. <laughs> so maybe the word is out that you can travel to this place. But it was um, really exciting uh, when I attended this. They, they have their DH space in the library there. And just a lot of different tools. And I just could not believe I was attending a conference like that for free, just hearing from all these different experts from around the world they brought in to, um, to talk about different things. And I think Jessica maybe has either been invited or actually did go out and talk there. Yeah, we're going back this year. Oh, you're so. going back? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's that's been um, kind of one of my challenges is like trying to be a better advocate and collaborator to inform myself of all of the different methods, um, different projects, and you know what I can help provide you know in terms of library support um, for digital humanities. Um, <clears throat> these are two instances where um, I didn't get to attend. So one of them being the Digital Humanities <coughs> Institute for Mid-Career Librarians, which sounds perfect, <laughs> but I missed the deadline for this. What was it? I think they were looking for librarians that finished school, I think in 2005, 2006 or something, and I graduated from library school in 2008. So it was like, I was in this weird, like not early career librarian, but by their standards, not mid-career. So I didn't get to attend that. Um, but that was um, a, a cool project that I'm gonna continue to see if, if they've um, uh, found a way to have it again, because I think it was, it was uh, funded with a Mellon Foundation grant. So that's how they had that. Um, HILT is the Humanities Intensive Learning and Training. Um, and it's not far away, it's just over in Indiana. And um, <clears throat> that sounds like a fantastic training program, um, but also very expensive. They have it in the summertime, I believe, um, each year. Um, but yeah, so funding would, is an issue. And the other thing that I learned um, I got in touch with the English and Digital Humanities Librarian at University of Illinois when I first got here. I knew her from um, other stuff. It's a small world, the library world. Um, she's actually headed down to run WashU's own library like starting next week. But <clears throat> I um, met with her multiple times to just like pick her brain and say like, what do I need to be doing to be a better, you know, humanities librarian or digital humanities librarian? And I'm like, I need to know how to code and I need to know how to do this and all these methods and she's like well it would be great if you knew how to do all those things but you really like if you don't have the context it doesn't really make a lot of sense so if you're just learning to code to learn to code um, you're, you're missing something there but if you can become part of a project and have that to focus on and go and to one of these trainings like HILT um, that, that made more sense so I was like that's solid advice. Um, and when I was at KU, I attended a session on, on mapping and like working with GIS um, software. And it was fun, but they kind of gave us, they gave us data to play with, but it didn't really have, you know, much meaning for me because I wasn't involved in any particular project needing, you know, to, to have those skills. Um, okay. So, the other thing that I did, and I mentioned a little earlier, <clears throat> was that I went to Wash U's um, VAC camp in November of 2013. So right after I started, I mean, they didn't charge a um, registration fee. It was on a Saturday. <laughs> like, okay, you know, it made sense for me to go. And there were quite a few of us that, that went over and attended that um, because it's so close. And Maybe it was cheeky of me, but I sort of left that and I was like, we could do this at SIV and we could do it better. <laughs> we could make it run better. Um, so that was like, that was one of my goals that I came back um, uh, to SIU and said we were going to do this and we did. <laughs> so it's been two years since we, we had our 
um, are that camp. So if you're not familiar with it, it's the Humanities and Technology Camp. Um, and if you go to thatcamp.org, they have a toolkit um, that you can download and walks you through all the steps to um, host a that camp. Um, and then they also give you space on their server to create a, a page and it also has a registration form. It's clunky <laughs> um, and it's powered by WordPress on the back end. Um, and, but we, we did that. So there were rules like if you were gonna have that branding, that camp, um, using their page and everything that you would uh, have it be a small um, conference, that it would be an unconference format um, that you would not charge a registration fee or it would be under $25 to attend. Um, so we had to follow those rules. Um, and I kind of just like put it in my back pocket thinking about this, but I was talking to my colleague uh, who isn't with us um, at uh, SIU anymore. She moved on to um, University in Alabama, uh, but Melissa Burrell, she was our catalog librarian at the time and I told her about this and I said, yeah, and SIU has an internal grant um, for conferences and workshops, so that could fund it. And she said, why aren't we doing this? So um, she's, uh, she and I sat down, wrote the grant, um, we got the funding, $5,001. Um, I don't know how the budget worked out like that, but it did. And um, we had about 70 people attend um, from around the state of Illinois, and um, also people came over across the river from institutions there. And um, I like to think that it went really well. <laughs> um, ben was, you won our maker challenge, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, so we had. Um, Put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we had uh, a maker it, it challenge. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And so we asked uh, participants to create something while they were there at the unconference at the VET camp. Um, and then we voted to see who were winners. and had some technology prizes to hand out. So it was fun. And uh, Christina and Jessica were so gracious as to um, give an open talk, which essentially was, what is the digital humanities? Um, so we tried to like circumvent having a session on that, <laughs> which, I, which I think that that, that, um, that helped. Um, so yeah. So that is essentially like what I um, what I shared at this um, networking the regional comprehensive, um, and in our last session um, at this um, summit, we had a brainstorming session for a few hours where we talked about okay, well, well what are we going to do about this? Being a librarian, I'm like, well, well we need a directory. <laughs> so my thought was that we needed to. Um, have a place where we can be populating like all these different institutions, the practitioners, their projects, the centers at, at these um, at these size institutions. So we have plans to do that. There's also a Google spreadsheet. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but I don't remember what year it was. Somebody had said that we uh, some, or a, a DH conference was criticized for not having. Um, female or um, uh, panelists of color um, at this conference. And so they were like, well, we don't know where the women DH practitioners are. <laughs> so, so there was a, um, yeah, so a crowdsourced um, Google spreadsheet now that you can go and, and look at. And um, I don't know if, if you filled in your information on there. I know I've seen um, Dr. Desain, uh in that spreadsheet, um, but that's that's kind of what I was thinking about. <clears throat> so that we would send this out to regional comprehensives and say like, hey, you know, add in your information and we'll have this directory there. And uh, um, so we'll do that. The other thing that we um, brainstormed and they were very pa passionate about the the team that was working on this is a statement of empowerment. So that <laughs> will be featured um, on, uh, on here as well. So basically a document to advocate to administrators for funding or just, um, just for recognition as well. Um, 
at your campus. And we also brainstormed uh, what other models um, for something like this exist um, to kind of guide us in how we, we will continue to work on this project and, and populate it. Um, okay, so let me get this out here. Uh, if you would be so kind to participate here <laughs> in a little activity, and this will be uh, my closing. I'm kind of interested to get your um, feedback. I have some pictures up here, and I want you to think about this question. So how do you advocate for the digital humanities, or what does advocacy look like to you? And choose a picture, so come on up. Choose a picture that answers that question. <laughs> This very much feels like a humanity <laughs> <laughs> Summit, and these were the pictures. Did anybody choose one of these pictures? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, um, yeah, I asked them um, to pick a picture, and then I asked um, for people to share. So I don't know if any of you want to share, like, why you chose that picture, like, what it represents. It did, it's uh, the what it says on the back isn't what I thought it was. So on the back it says focus on talent, um, but I saw this as cross pollination. So the idea of um, reaching out across discipline boundaries and then inside and outside of the academy, uh, looking for opportunities to advocate for, for the age. So that's kind of what, that's what drew me to the butterfly was the idea of pollination. Okay, cool, <laughs> cool. Um, I chose um, the girl with the magnifying glass. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> because I think, you know, Curiosity and fostering curiosity in yourself and other people is like really the core of it. Mm -hmm. Wanting to discover new things and new ways of doing things. Okay. Yeah. I'll go. <laughs> so I picked the one with the people grasping each other's wrists like that. And okay. I picked that because um, here and even at some of the conferences Ben and I have attended things, there's a lot about like, you know, styling and how kind of DH scholarship in a way is sometimes kept apart and how um, sometimes that prevents us from working together and creating this environment in which we really can advocate for ourselves together and go kind of to the administrators or whoever to try and get, you know, funding resources, that sort of thing. So the idea of maybe just kind of working together to try and come up with a plan um, that will maybe help with that. She's gonna start I'll show that. So, uh, <laughs> I won't cut down I did choose the money one. Um, <laughs> because uh, well, in a loose sense, I feel like I've always been a big fan of the. I think it's the economist Joseph Schumpeter line that like show me a show me an institution's budget and I'll show you what it actually values. Okay. Um, and I think obviously part of advocating a big big part of advocating is the money side of things mm -hmm. within an institution. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a big issue for digital humanities as a whole that digital humanities is somewhat resource intensive in an era when. Uh, increasing inequality is really reshaping academia in the United States. 
and I've told the story a lot, but poor Ben's going to hear the story a bunch of times. <laughs> it's uh, okay. a, couple, a couple summers ago, I think, when they were doing some work to try to get some new software for the book scanner and Iris Lab, and I also I went to the University of Iowa Library that funded some research, and on the main floor of the main library there, they have like six book scanners just sitting there for students to use, not like in a controlled setting. Yeah. Uh, and so it was a sign, I think, right, that like, the, the, I think there's a level of inequality in American higher education that we're still, still picking up that's really important for us, that those of us with the regional comprehensive and ours about. And the flip side, I think what we can do really well is we can't do it for the places too. Uh, so anyways, I chose the name. It'd be smart though. Yeah. I chose two cards. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm judging your, your like, you can't even pick one card. Like, you're <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I don't think I said you could. Look, Laura has all those. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Laura can like. Never mind. So I chose the one with the research uh, lab, oh. and I also chose the one diving off the deep end. Okay. Because, because both apply. I mean, you have to be a pioneer of sorts to go where no one's gone before us with Star Trek and the Treasury. Um, <laughs> and then also you're collaborating and learning together. I mean, it's, it's like a lab experience, too, because you can, and that's what the digital humanities and the back camps have shown me. Some encouragement to uh, collaborate with others, uh, brainstorm, and you get the encouragement to go ahead and take that leap. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little scary by yourself, but you don't have to do it alone. Mm -hmm. So I've never done this before. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I chose two pictures. I okay. chose the one with the camera and the one with the water droplet. And um, like, I think it's just like focusing in on like, what you're really, really interested in and like what you stand for, what you believe in, and then like applying that to like teaching and digital humanities and all that other stuff that you're really like interested in. And then like if you're really interested in research, you can focus on that. So that's why I chose that. I chose the fractal because I'm kind of trying to, I guess, put a spin on Christine's definition of taking old things and making them new. My main concern is actually taking new things and making them old, allowing, <laughs> allowing things like you know journalistic efforts and like social media that, that seems I think people aren't engaging with it on a serious level sometimes because it's, it is so temporal and um, it, it floats past and ephemeral, right? Um, and if we can connect to hey, there's a real society, <laughs> societal implications of what you're saying and what you're doing. On these digital spaces, if we can connect kind of long-term digital to the short-term chaotic craziness that goes on in my field, I think we'll be better for it. Uh, it, it comes particularly from a journalism background, when journalists used to write for newspapers that were the rough draft of history, but also the public record. If you go back and flip through old papers and look at the microfiche and see like what was going on on this day 30 years ago, and it's a, it's a plot device in a lot of movies, they go get the microfiche, they look at Stranger Things, and I'm like, Damn it, like, what are we, that, there's no Twitter equivalent of that. Mm -hmm. And I think if people had more connection to history uh, and saw that, you know, it's all, it's all connected, <laughs> we'd be better off. And so that's my interest in that digital. Cool. <laughs> so I chose the this one, it's a sketch of a face, but it has like different equations that's maybe algebra, I'm not even trying to guess what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I really liked it because, um, I like the idea of the digital humanities not only preserving but creating literature and humanities for the um, posterity. I mean, you can take, well, like the Weinberg World Digital Edition is, that is preserving something, but you can also add on to it. Like, there were new versions of the Weinberg World, they could become solely digital. Um, so that, that's why I should be for me. Cool. Well, I guess since I'm the only one, I'll go ahead. <laughs> so, my picture I thought was um, someone on a tightrope, but it actually, now that I'm looking at it closer, I think it's somebody pole vaulting. So <laughs> let's go, let's assume that this is actually a tightrope, because okay. that's what I was thinking about. Um, so the way I thought about it was, it's, you know, it's all about balance, it's all about finding a balance between the two forces. So for example, old, what is oldness, what is newness, finding the balance between that, and also um, finding the balance between having a lot of resources and not having how do you find a place within a system that may not value what it is you're valuing? And I don't know. I mean, it make a whole lot of sense because I chose the wrong picture, but. <laughs> I, 
whatever you see in the picture is yeah. what is, is to be seen. Yeah, definitely a photographer. <laughs> Even if it is pole vaulting, that yeah. involves balance as well. That is true, right. there is balance in yeah. pole vaulting. And right. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you all for sharing. You didn't have to, so that was really cool. And it's been captured on video and audio. Um, <laughs> I mean, the audio may not pick up very well. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll pick a, a snap a picture of all the ones that, that you guys chose too. I think it's interesting that um, that some some of the ones that um, were chosen at uh, the CDH Summit, you guys chose as well. Um, but I love, I love doing that activity because sometimes um, I can't, I, I'm, I'm very um, prompted by, by something visual. So I, I loved everything that you shared. Um, and I was thinking about it too, as, as some of you were talking, so most of, of, of the participants at the CDH Summit were um, professors. There were the two librarians, um, and then there was the one um, uh, administrator. And he uh, actually used to be um, a professor of English um, and has moved into this administrative role. And I'm like, oh, I just love administrators like that because they know about the classroom. <laughs> um, and he really emphasized, like, you know, come to me with fewer problems, like asking <laughs> for the, um, from the administrative side, like if you come, you know, with more solutions and fewer problems. And, and we really tried to stay away from talking too much about, um, about money. Um, uh, at this, but of course you, it, it does come back to, to funding. So anyway, um, <coughs> that's me. <laughs>